Welcome to Curtis High School for this candidate's forum for University Place City Council positions one, three, and four on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and the City of University Place. I'm Liz Kernitz Thurlow. I'm a member of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County, and I will be the moderator. The timekeeper is Susan Eidenschink from the League. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. Elections and voting are therefore core issues for the League of Women Voters. Since 1920, we've been providing information on issues and positions candidates take on those issues to help voters make their own decisions and participate in the process. Conducting forums like this is one of the ways we encourage informed and active participation. Your participation today helps us carry out that mission. Thank you for coming. To television viewers, thank you for watching. If you have an interest in being involved in this process, the League of Women Voters welcomes members, both women and men. So pick up a member brochure, talk to me after the forum, or call the League. This forum is being recorded by UPTV for later broadcast. I would ask that all other recording devices be turned off. No parts of this forum should be used in any candidate literature or advertising, and use of the League name is not authorized. And please take your telephone and turn off the sound if you have not already done so. Ground rules were sent to candidates. Questions will primarily come from you, the audience, and they're being submitted on index cards, and I have a whole lot of them here, which is great. If you wish to write a question, signal for a card and then give it back to a card collector when you're done. I will use what's appropriate, probably combining and rewording, and I decide how much time is available to answer each question. All candidates get equal time to answer the same questions. The order of answering will rotate. Before questions, each candidate has 90 seconds in which to make an opening statement, and at the end, candidates will get one minute each to make the closing statement. Candidates were also asked to prepare one question for the opponent. The person who's asked the question will have 60 seconds to answer. The asker may then have 30 seconds in which to respond. The timekeeper will signal when there's one minute remaining, 30 seconds, 15, and when it's time to see the stop. When you see the stop card, you may finish your sentence. We will be hearing from candidates for council positions one, three, and four. Position five is also up for election but the incumbent, Denise McCluskey, is unchallenged and is not attending. The candidates for position one are Betsy Tainer and Javier Figueroa. Mr. Figueroa regrets that he is unable to attend and has sent an opening statement, which I will read, but Ms. Tainer is here. The candidates for position three are Steve Worthington and Ken Campbell. Only Mr. Worthington is in attendance. For position four, the candidates are Ken Grassi and Carl Molnow. Both of them are here. Welcome to you all. All candidates will answer the same questions and all will have the same time and the order of answering will rotate. Okay. Each candidate now has one and a half minutes in which to make an opening statement and we're beginning with me reading Mr. Figueroa's statement. Okay, so this is not my words. This is him. University Place is a vibrant and growing business community with a lot of character and uniqueness. To ensure the economy in our community continues to grow, small businesses need to succeed and create jobs. We need to address what they care about most and make UP more business friendly. Because when a local business owner is deciding where to set up shop, they're most likely to choose where they live. And we want both of these to be right here in University Place. 12 years in the U.S. Army and serving as council member and mayor has taught me how to accept responsibility, to work together for solutions and lead to completion. I will use these skills to address the needs of our community and make sure we have an economic plan to support our needs. 21 years as a business arbitrator and mediator provides me the skill set to help our council pass smart policies that actually help small businesses. To be viable and competitive, we have to have economic development and job creation opportunities to serve every family, our schools, and every business in University Place. 
I'm Javier Figueroa, and I will be honored to have your vote. Now, Ms. Tainer gets to do her own opening statement. Thank you. Um, thank you for putting this on. I'm Bessie Tainer. I'm running for city council. That's why we're here. I'm not a politician. This is all new to me, and it will be a challenge. I'm up to it. I am also a veteran of the United States Army, and I believe that we can do better, that we need to control our spending, our budget, and have a very real policy to address our debt. And I believe that we can do this without shaking all of our residents upside down for their spare change. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Worthington. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here, and good evening. <clears throat> uh, my name is Steve Worthington. I'm uh, running for re-election for position number three, ending my first term. And tonight I, I ask you to vote for me when the election ballot comes to your mailbox. Here's the reason why I, I think you will, uh, uh, you may be interested in voting for me. Here's, here's the reasons. During my first term as a city council member here, I tried to and did in fact pull together and use the 30 years of previous management experience I've had in local government. Uh, to help address the different issues that were being brought to the council and to work through those issues in a thoughtful and meaningful and I believe effective way. Um, I have had that experience as a city manager, as a community development director for other cities in our state and today I consult with businesses in our cities I should say in four different states and helping them build their management teams. Additionally, I've been a business person as well. Early in my married life, when I married Jill some 41 years ago, we started a business in Spokane and continued that business until uh, for a number of years. In our operations of the city today, I've worked with the city council to be effective at reducing the expenses of the city to the extent we now have a balanced budget that doesn't rely on one-time revenue. That's been a key piece. We've also managed to reduce our debt, and uh, that has been a step in the right direction. At the end of tonight, I hope you'll agree that Worthington is worth your vote. Thank you. Thank you. Could we please hold all applause till the end of the evening, at which point it will be appropriate. Thank you very much. Mr. Molno. Hello, my name is Carl Molno. Lived in University Place for 47 years. And uh, my whole clue here at University Place when uh, I got here is because we were a low tax city. Other cities were raising their taxes and coming over here. It was great until we started to become a city. And I got in involved in that, Citizens for Incorporation, uh, because I wanted to make sure that the city paid as they went rather than borrow and go into debt. And what, when I, I ran for the city council many times, the first time we became a city, I ran for position number six. And my statement then was, that we pay as we go, we don't borrow a lot of money, we use common sense, and don't go off the rails. And that's exactly what we've done in the last 22 years. As a Air Force pilot, a flight instructor, ground instructor, simulator instructor, uh, I was a truck driver, I fixed airplanes for four years in the Air Force before I became a pilot, and common sense was the main thing in my life in transportation. We, the city of University Place, when we became a city, we, we got into the beautification and traffic calming mode. We never had a traffic problem. What we did was we got into traffic calming, which includes a lot of different things that cost a lot of money. Go to your computer, uh, Google traffic calming, you'll see what it is. We've done all of those. We put in streets that close down from four lanes, two lanes in each direction to one in each direction. We've got roundabouts, which cost a million dollars. We, amen. Thank you. Carol Mullen. We do have. Uh, no. On the next, about, when you answer something else, you can put that in if you'd like. But time has to be equal. Mr. Grassi. It's not if it's about one of the former members. Mr. Grassi. Who has time. It's. Oh, I'm sorry. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for coming out tonight. You know, over the past years, I've often said about University Place that the best is yet to come. But tonight, I'm excited to tell you that the best days for University Place are here. New construction, redevelopment are at an all-time high. Uh, building permits are up 25% right now over a five-year average. We have a su 
sustainable budget, no longer dependent on one-time revenues, things like the U.S. Open. City departments are operating under budget, and many city revenues are exceeding projections. And public safety remains our number one priority. In 2008, when the recession hit this area, we were encouraged to drop plans for town center, have a fire sale on the acquired property, and move on. I believe that good things happen to those who wait. Together we weathered the storm, and today we can be grateful for that decision as we watch Town Center grow and prosper. But here's the great news. Private development dollars in Town Center exceed $115 million, over double what the city invested for infrastructure improvements and land acquisitions, and that helped attract development. And the city benefits now and for the future include new sales, property, and utility taxes from new residents and new businesses. And that's going to help pay off the town center debt. Thank you. Now we move to questions. If a candidate feels the absolute need to rebut something said by another, he or she may indicate so to me and then have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. The other candidate may then have 15 seconds to respond. <clears throat> the first three questions were submitted by the City of University Place. As I, re as I read Mr. Figueroa's statement first, Ms. Tainer gets to answer the first question first. Um, well, question one, the city wrote, what do you view as the most important issues currently facing the city? A question from a candidate narrowed it and broadened it at the same time by saying, what are the three most important issues currently facing the city, and how will you address them? So um, since it's two put together and we're really asking for a lot of information, you may have a minute and a half if you want it. Ms. Tainer, you're first. Thank you. Um, I think really for a long period of time, our biggest issues have been our debt in combination with our spending. I've seen a lot of spending decisions on the city council at the city council meetings where new equipment, vehicles, whatnot, um, lighting and turf on fields where the park and rec department were shut down are just made instantaneously with no thought. And the the matching grant money with no consideration just because something's on sale and you have matching money does not necessarily mean that you can afford it. I think all of these things need to be considered more carefully. I've had um, someone say to me one time that if you watch your nickels, the dollars will take care of themselves. And I think it's time for us to watch our nickels. Thank you. Mr. Worthington. Thank you. So <clears throat> with regards to the single most important issue I think facing the city today. And then there's two sub-issues sub that are related to that, but the single most uh, important issue I believe is careful planning choices about our future. We are in a, a, a difficult but uh, doable situation today where we have had a, a challenge in our budget. We're through that initial period of time, but we need to continue to make choices that allow our local economy to grow and allow our community to retain its character. And to do that, it takes careful, thoughtful planning to be able to get there. The reason we need to have that economic development growth here is so that we can continue to deliver services that our residents are used to. And uh, more specifically, how we can increase the public safety uh, services that are available to our residents. We have a very low ratio of officers to population that's challenging at times. But uh, given the resources of today, it's at a level that we can, can afford. That won't continue in the future unless we're able to carefully plan and grow our economy effectively to provide for public safety and the other services that our residents uh, and our businesses here in University Place expect. Those are the primary issues and I think the next steps for us. Uh, those are key. We're giving, uh, we, we have that balanced budget today, uh, not just balanced but sustainable, so it's on uh, regular revenues, and that's an excellent place to start looking to the future about what those planning choices are. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Molnow. The money, the, the problem with uh, the city is this the problems money, money, money. Both of these other candidates talk about the sustainable 
money to pay off our debt. We are $68 million in debt with debt, and we can't pay for it. The reason we have lost services is because we have such a debt, we can't even make the payments, so we have to extend them out for 20 years to 2027, 2037. And according to the budget, which you can go to the website and find out, it'll tell you what it is, out to 2037, we can do it for about 10 years, and then they're going to be looking for more taxes. You've already been uh, charged $20 for your tabs. Uh, another, they were going to float a recreational uh, uh, place to uh, get more money and more taxes, which failed. Thank goodness people were smart enough not to vote for it. It's money, money, money. And if the very same people who say how oh, we're doing great, we're paying our bills, they're only paying our bills because we've dropped so many services to you, the people who live in University Place. And when we first started this thing, we had plenty of money. We were one million over. Now we're so far in debt that you'll probably never be able to see it being paid off because we're going to borrow more money for beautification, traffic calming, and all the other stupid things that they've already borrowed money for. Town center, 51 percent of that debt that we still owe, not including the budget and the things that we do in town to make it work, uh, is not going to end soon. We're all going to be dead by the time they pay it off, and we probably never will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Grassi, do you want to take Mr. Molnow's microphone for a minute sure. since they haven't brought yours back? Just share microphone. Okay. Okay. I assume it will come back. All right. The top three issues um, that I see, number one, public safety. It has been and will continue to be a number one priority for the city. Uh, there's no question about that. When we had the budget discussion at the beginning of this year, there was a lot of debate. There's lots of needs in the city, lots of things that we wanted to do, but the council came together as a whole and decided that it was important to hire a new detective, and we did that with a 10-year commitment. So it was a, a huge budget uh, conversation, but we made the right decision. I believe that number two would be to uh, continue the momentum on town center to bring in quality businesses that will succeed for many years to come and the momentum is here it's strong it's going and that will continue and then debt repayment there's a lot of talk about debt but I want to be perfectly clear 31 million dollars it's what is what's attributed to town center just last year uh, our finance department is second to none they were able to do a refinance that saved the city just under $4 million. We are making tremendous progress on debt. It's no different than buying a home, buying a car. I don't personally know anyone, and I would ask the question of all of you as well, how many people do you know that can pay cash for large purchases and projects? It just doesn't happen. A city has to go in debt, reasonable debt, to make things happen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, from now on, it's one minute. I'd like, I'd like, okay. okay, first you. I'd like to respond to that. that. Uh, we really didn't have to go into debt. We had $1 million more than we were spending. And as far as public safety is concerned, but we, we've lost plenty of, of our officers and reduced because we owe so much money. We can't even pay the money off uh, the debt, and that's why we keep dropping services, dropping uh, place for okay. all people to go. You may have 15 seconds to answer and you have your own microphone back. No. Thank you. Do I have, did I get the time? That... Yeah, you got, you asked your question. Well, if you look at our crime statistics that we get quarterly at our council meetings, the crime rate and the incidences in University Place are fantastic. Our, our police force and our chief are, they do an amazing job. They wear many hats. And yes, would we like to have more officers? That's our goal for the future. Thank you. Ms. Tainer, you also had something? Yes. The, the police force that University Place contracts through Pierce County for, I think that University Place would do well to have their own police department. For four and a half million dollars a year, we have limited amount of funds. We're contracting out a lot of services. We need to be more self-sufficient. We have numerous line items in the Lakewood budget where they're touting the contracts they carry for us on Thank services. Thank you. The next question is about, is about police. So you get to do it. 
do more. In University Place, property taxes pay for public safety. The city's property tax revenue grows approximately 1% per year, which is less than the average increase in the city's police contract with Pierce County. If elected, how do you propose the city address public safety in University Place? Mr. Worthington, you're first. Thank you. Appreciate it. In this particular case, I think the answer is a challenging one uh, because we are limited to 1% growth. And I know you're thinking your property bill, tax bill grows each year more than that. In fact, it may for a variety of reasons, but the share of the city receives grows by 1% of uh, total revenue each year. The contract rate increases by at least 3%. So pretty soon these lines, as you chart those things, you're going to see the lines separating, and we go what might be referred to as underwater relying on property tax. The answer is we have to grow the pie. We need to get a larger budget uh, uh, from our, we need to increase our property tax revenues by growing the values within our community. And that's what I mean by growing the pie. And it comes back to making those sustain sustainable choices in our development pattern and our planning processes. Thank you. Mr. Molnow. Talk about public safety. We're not going to increase our public safety if we don't have the money to do that. And we don't have the money to do it, like Steve just said, because our tax base is going to be going down. We've lost businesses based on the fact that the city is really friendly to businesses. And if we don't get really common sense here and get rid of some of the stupid things we've been doing, like putting up 82 plants these beautiful flower pots going down Bridgeport, uh, 36 over here, uh, over by the, uh, the golf course, Chambers Bay, and other places around. We don't need those plants. We need public safety. Take that money, $500 a, a, a blossom or for per pot, and we're putting this stuff out. We got plants going every place. Quit the planning, get those plants down. Let's get public safety. Let's put that money someplace else. When you're driving down the street, you don't have to look at plants and things like that. You should be driving, should no, no, not distracted driving. We need to get rid of that stuff so that we can put the money into public safety like they say. We can't do that, let's, let's talk about it. You're gonna get out here and talk about it because it's part of the planning of the city for, what do we call it? It's beautification. We don't need beautification, we need public safety, we need other things, thank you. Thank uh, you. Well, uh, Mr. Grassi. Twice in the last 22 years, the city did a very comprehensive study, uh, a private police force versus our county contract. And the comparison never was a match. The, to do it privately was far more expensive. And the thing with the county contract that we wouldn't be able to have with the private police force, they give us all kinds of other um, affords us many other features that we would not have things like a SWAT team they have a extensive group of detectives that they will pull so that we can use them in our city that we wouldn't have the resource for so the county contract has been a marvelous thing for university place it's priced very fairly and we've always gotten more for our money but the thing that I I want to make sure that is stated, Liz already stated it earlier, but that every cent that you pay in property tax that comes to the city, every cent goes to public safety. It's a separate line item. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tainer. Um, let me have, let Mr. Tainer answer the question, please. A, a lot of people, sadly, are very unaware of all of the ways they're being taxed and believe that when the city touts that how the property tax is solely being used for police, that it's all the money that they have. It's so sad. It's not true. They have a lot of different revenue sources. And the truth is that a lot of communities around us, the police are actually drawing in some revenue for the city with traffic patrols, which we need desperately. We have a lot of people running up and down our streets at ridiculous rates of speeds, putting our kids in danger. And the, the Pierce County Sheriff doesn't do a lot of traffic patrol. We could have more control and it would spend us, a, charge us a lot less money to have our own police force. And uh, I'm wondering what we really need with a SWAT team. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Molnad, did she cover what you needed to say? I'd like to talk about the 
the public safety, please. Okay, when I, um, the first city council, I ran for the first city council, I was on Citizens Ford Corporation, and uh, there was an argument between us that worked in the Citizens Corporation about getting our own police force versus use of the county. And everybody on the, that ran for the council and actually did to be council was against that. It was my idea. I went to the, to the sheriff's department, I went to the county and okay. put in it was you were not. And they not used my idea rather than the idea that they said. So the idea that thank that you, Mr. Krause the time is up, and oh, that is not a rebuttal. It makes talking about something different. Next question, and you will be answering it first, Mr. Molnow. Economic development as a mechanism to generate revenue to pay for city services has long been a priority for existing and previous city councils. What ideas do you think need to be explored or emphasized over the next four years for economic development? It's you, Mr. Molnow. The next four years, what we need to do is quit the beautification idea and the, the traffic calming. That's absorbing most of the money. We don't need the plants, the flowers, the beautification. Put that into things that we need, like the police force, services. We've lost services because of this beautification and traffic calming. And like I say, if you go over to and Google just traffic calming and see all the 20, 30 things with, with the streets, closing them down, making two lanes into one lane, putting roundabouts, putting flat spots in front of the uh, big uh, building we have out there that we paid many, many dollars for. Actually, it's an it, uh, uh, intermodal transit facility, which we scammed the U.S. government out of for four or five million dollars. And it never was an intermodal transit facility, never will be. So we have to pay that back. This gentleman even asked our city lawyer, should we, or do we have to? And it's just one dumb thing after another. You gotta quit spending money, flowers, traffic, calming, and all the other things that we can't use that die after a few days. You have to water them. This is really done. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Grassi. Well, the city works hard on economic development, and I think that's evident when you drive up and down Bridgeport, you drive down 27th Street, things are happening, cranes are going up, construction is underway. You know, we're, we have become the envy of Pierce County with Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and Harbor Greens. There are other cities that would literally die to have those retailers, but they chose University Place for a reason, and that's because this city has a sense of place. We've also, as you're probably aware of in the news, that Amazon is looking for different locations. They want to be in cities, classy cities. They want to be um, with a freeway distance to their Seattle headquarters, of course, but we are in that process and we've sent out a bid to try and attract that type of industry to the city. We're working hard on economic development and it's paying off. We've got, um, Home Goods coming soon. The sign is now up at uh, Green Furs. New restaurants coming. People have finally caught on that university is the place to be, to do business, to live, to work, to play. And my opponent doesn't believe in beautification. I'm just going to say that I do. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Ms. Tainer. I'd like to respond to... No, Ms. Tainer. I like the beautification. I think that we've spent a lot of money on things that we didn't need to, and then replacing new signs with new signs and new signs um, has gotten a little silly. But we don't have the economic base that some of our surrounding communities do, Five, Puyallup, um, Tacoma. I'd like to see more diversity in, in our economic development plan. Um, less dentist office, less nonprofits, things that will help us. I believe that the entertainment tax or fee is really unnecessary and it's um, actually a detriment to economic development. We need to watch out for the cost of starting and investing in University Place so that people will come here. Thank you. Mr. Worthington. 
Thank you. So the question is about mixed-use development and how can we work with that? What can we do with it? So mixed-use development is, as the name implies, brings both residential and commercial or services. We have commercial services on the ground floor, residential above. One of the advantages it brings is it builds, to some degree, a market for the businesses that are on the main floor, uh, with those additional references, or residences, rather. Our challenges often here are showing that we have a strong enough local market to bring in certain businesses, and growing rooftops or bringing in new residents helps make that formula work for certain businesses. What we can do to make a, uh, to do a little better job on that, another challenge we have is the inventory, the property available for such development. One of the things we can look for on council, and I would like to work with the rest of the council members on, is policies that could change redevelopment here. And so we are able to move redevelopment, change the economics a little bit through some policy changes in order to spur that forward and bring older properties that are underserved or underused, redevelop them, and make them available for mixed-use processes or mixed-use uh, projects. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're done with the questions from the city. And here's one. The last UP forum I moderated was over the proposal to add a tax to pay for recreational programs. It failed. So, University Place does not have the recreation department it used to. Do you find this acceptable? And do you have suggestions for improving and paying for city-sponsored recreation activities such as senior services and youth sports? And Mr. Grassi, you're first. Thank you. You know, it was, a, it was a tragedy to see the recreation department have to close. And it was a tough choice. And it's a choice that I hope someday we will be able to reverse. But we're very grateful that the Community Connection Place came forward, kept our senior center open, and is continuing to add new programs for senior citizens. They're now working on youth programs. They had a wonderful youth camp. So good things are happening in, in that area too. And the city is working with them. They're a fantastic partner. And we believe it's the beginning to revive some of the things that were lost. But the schools have been great um, and helping to put together lists where the kids and the families can sign up for recreational and sports programs outside of the city right now and some within. So it's something that we'll continue to work on and um, hopefully bring back slowly and it may be in, in a different form than what it was once. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tanner. I would like to see um, our youth sports programs brought back in recreation services. I was a heavy opponent to the taxing level for the recreation, park and recreation district. I did not see it as a responsible move for us. I was very sad that it was shut down and that the city council made that choice. In that same city council meeting, the city council members chose to spend the money to put in field lighting and turf in a park service where they had just shut down the youth sports program. Just one example of the kind of spending choices that are made with our tax dollars. We're touted as being, throughout the area, as being a little upper crust and snobby. And we need to come to realize that the people of University Place, for the most part, are middle class, hardworking people and, and need all the money that's coming into their households. And we need to be respectful of that when we make choices. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Worthington. So it was a difficult decision to decide to shut down the recreation program, but the choices uh, are very limited. So we keep in mind the parks program is still in place. We still have parks, they're still maintained, and people still be, can recreate on them. I may get back to that in a moment. But there had to come $400 million, $400,000, excuse me, $400,000 out of the budget in order to get it to balance year into the next year uh, and subsequent years. That's in a process that hadn't been followed previously. There were very, very few places to take that money away. Recreation was something we could stop doing. We couldn't stop police. We couldn't stop public works. We needed to do all those things. Recreation, though, has other providers outside of our borders or in the private marketplace that can help carry some of that. And while that was a tough decision, it was, in my mind, still the right decision, 
least we lose further officers or we have other service impacts that there was no backstop to. So that's how we got there, and it was the right thing to do in my mind. Thank you. Okay, he's not your opponent, but you may have 30 seconds. We had all of these one-time revenue Sorry. streams coming in, and we chose not to use those for the services that we need. And again, we have park and road maintenance department that does not do park maintenance. That's contracted out to a profit-making enterprise. There's no need, reason for us to spend that kind of money like that. You need 15 seconds, Mr. Worthington, and then Mr. Molnar, you get your time. Yes, a process question? So I'm not running against Betsy. I know. Okay, but it's okay. But I can have It's the seconds. issue. You get your 15 seconds. All right. All right. Very good. Uh, thank you. So one-time money was actually what had historically been used, and that got to be our problem. We needed to cut the one-time money. We needed to cut expenses, and that was the place to make that cut. Okay. Uh, thank you. Mr. Milner. Tax reduction. We're talking about the, the services the Recreation Department. It was their own fault. They had so much debt. If you look at the tax reduction debt plan for the city itself, there's no chance they can do it the way they're talking about. It's pure gobbledygook garbage. The only way we can do it is stop planning things in the air, uh, flowers all over the place, uh, closing down roadways, which really torque people off. You got to quit the planning. We don't have room for all the all that stuff. That's uh, five hundred thousand and million dollars a year just on plants for the roundabouts for the middle of the street down the roads up in the air over at uh, Chambers Bay Golf Course and all the other places. If you go out and just look at the plants around the place, just taking those flowers, they're not cheap. He buys where they buy them from, I don't know, but it's a lot of money. If each one of those things would stop, we could put money into the uh, recreational program. We're paying $300,000 a month just on the debt. Look it up, look into the city to own records and online. It's right there, I left it out there in the front. Thank you. Now we will have the candidates for position four ask each other their questions. The person asked will have one minute to answer. The asker may then have up to 30 seconds to respond. Mr. Molnow, your question for Mr. Grassi, please. Uh, the question for Mr. Grassi is, we are $68 million in debt, and we're talking about getting more uh, money to buy other things that we don't have yet or we just got rid of including police officers and recreation department and things for kids to do. How are you going to do what you just said you were going to do based on the fact that you've got to charge these people more taxes to do something you said you just didn't want to do and wouldn't do? Well, Mr. Grassi. First of all, we have no intention of raising new taxes to pay for anything. So I want to make that perfectly clear. We're making every debt payment that we have on time and working hard to even if there's opportunity, we talk about it continually to further reduce the debt sooner than later. So, um, and I, I want to comment too about spending 500000 to a million dollars on plants and hanging baskets. I don't know where that number comes from, but it's so far off that it's, it's ludicrous. First of all, we have a patron program in the city. People have given thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in donations because we have a very generous city. And so much of it is paid for by that and then it's uh, also partially covered out of budget and through public works. I'd like to answer that. You have 30 seconds. Okay, you say that, that you have all that money coming, but you never put a who did it and who does it. You see people out there changing the plants and doing all these things. It, money's got to come from someplace. You look at all the plants in all these different places along the roads, and in the, uh, it's got to come to big money. And you don't have that many people putting money into this. And if it is, what is the number? You said 5,000 one time. 5,000 is a joke. And you just can't, there's no way to do it. And this little thing says, sir, you don't have the money, you never will have the money. And it, yet your explanation compared to the fellow who figures this out, who gets paid for, Fiazan is his name, uh, there's a the big disparity as to what he says and what's on paper on your website and what you say. Thank you. Pardon. Mr. Grassi, your question for Mr. Mull now, please. Uh, Mr. Molno, if you are elected to City Council at the first meeting in January of 2018, what would be your top three priorities that you would want to see changed at once? What would you lobby for with your fellow council members to change well, it? First of all, like I say, is to quit with all the plans. We want to get more police officers. We'd like to get some uh, recreation services for 
of the, the city and also to be friendly to the uh, businesses that we've already put out of business by not letting them have a way to get to the to their uh, like the Burger King that went out of business now it's a dental office because you wouldn't let them uh, have a, a way to get in and a way to get out or put up a sign and that's not friendly so go in there and we don't need the plants we need the services we need uh, if they want plants let the people come out let the businesses put them out the businesses know whether plants will help them get more business and you got these things down the middle of the street take those plants out we're servicing those things we don't mean if you got the divider fine but we just got to quit spending money on needless things when we need services we need police we need recreation services and we need to pay down the debt which we're never going to pay by the own word of the people who figure this thing out what you pay big money to do thank that's you that's it do you want to respond mr grassi well my my only comment would be you mentioned more police sports programs but yet you're saying we don't have the money to pay for any of that so what you have to realize is that it takes four votes so you have to convince three other people on the council to support your idea of adding more but also justifying the fact that you don't have the money to do it so how do you do it thank you can i answer that nope sorry great thank you okay we're back to audience questions ms tainer will answer this one first it's a long question on June 26th, the City Council amended the zoning ordinance for Chambers Bay and approved adding residential buildings to the park with no one end date on how long anyone can reside inside the park. For years, the citizens of UP were promised that the area would remain a park and golf course with no mention of residences. Um, I would like to know how you voted or how you would have voted if on the council and um, would you vote to change the um, zoning back to block it? Ms. Tanner, one minute. Boy, that's tough. Um, Chambers Bay Golf Course is a county park, and um, pretty much what goes on there in the way of their development is out of our hands. Um, I would say as far as zoning, I thought it might have been a little clever just to make sure that those residences did not have a kitchen. <laughs> and then people wouldn't stay there very long. And they'd have to use the local restaurants to feed themselves. Um, I don't like the way the Chambers Bay development is being handled. I don't like public-private partnerships. I especially don't like public lands built, bought for, with public dollars um, used for private enterprise, I think that Pierce County would do well to carve out a little piece of land and sell it to somebody, and then we would benefit from the revenue of that property in the way of property taxes. But there again, we don't really have a say in that other than at county level. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Worthington. So the Chambers Bay Project, uh, is indeed owned by the county. Uh, however, uh, it does it is subject to the planning processes and city ordinances, city code, city inspection, and city zoning. We, we have a role. Um, the uh, uh, fact is this was in front of council on June 26th or thereabouts. Uh, we had uh, a, a good deal of discussion, uh, as particularly as we prepared for that. And what we were hearing, and I think accurately, uh, was that uh, it was necessary for the project to be able to have bank, bank financing, to be able to get the financing to move forward to build a hotel and the associated pro, uh, activities with it. In order to do that, the banks needed to have some assurance that there was alternative uses or opportunities there. And this didn't, in fact, open it up for residential. It opened it up for extended stay. And that distinction becomes important in the hotel industry because actually these units are meant as hotel units for longer term stays. That's uh, really what the purpose was. I voted for it. I still think it's the right choice. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Molnow. Yes, uh, the idea of having uh, extended stay or residential, I really don't care how they do it as long as it makes money. If you have extended stay, uh, we know what that is. Residential, they're there all the time. We know what that is. But if we're going to have a hotel, we got to have something for the hotel the people that come in and do if they're going to have a golf course the golf course 
most of the people in UP that I know can't afford to spend $200 to go golfing, so they're gonna to have to get people coming in. The golf course is not that great a deal. Listen to the golfers who played it, and uh, if you have people, have people come all over the world to, to do what this golf course says it can do, they, first of all, you gotta get some of the correct grass that they put in wrong, but any way they can do it to make money, to make the thing on its own, which it still isn't and never will be, I could care less. But the people, you, the people, will have to make that decision. But as long as it makes money, should be fine. Thank you, Period. Mr. Grassi. Yes, I did support um, that effort to allow extended stay. And I think it's important to know that the extended stay does have a limit of one year. It's kind of been said that it's just open-ended and they're permanent residents and people can move in and stay forever and that's not the case. The goal is to convert those rooms as soon as possible to hotel rooms because they're much more profitable for the owner of the project. But the property that it'll be built on, it's also very important to know that it does absolutely nothing to block views. It will enhance the trails so it's going to make it even better than what we have today. And it also puts more eyes on the property, making it safer. And as Mr. Worthington already said, it's, it's pretty much it's that way or the banks aren't going to give the money. And so if we want a project there, it's always about give and take. It's got to be a win-win for both. And I think it will be. I personally know one of the partners. I know his integrity. I've known him for over 30 years. And he is one that always goes over and above what the commitment is. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to respond to that. Is it really a rebuttal to what he said? Yes. Uh, he said, Mr. Grassi says he has someone that's going to go into it. But it's got to make money. And if you can't find someone. That's a, he didn't say anything to, about it not making money. So I really don't think that's relevant. We've got to find someone dumb it. enough to build it. Thank you. Question six is. Um, Go ahead. The plan that I had seen was there was, I believe, a phase three where they intended to build bungalows along the upper um, walking path. Wouldn't those interfere with the public spaces? That yes or no? I acknowledge that is not in the current plan. That was discussed at one time, but no longer in the plan because we didn't agree with that either. We don't want anything that blocks views, hinders trails, only enhances the property. Thank you. But great question. Thank you both. Thank you. Mr. Worthington, first, what is city government's primary function? Is University Place meeting this? If not, how do you propose accomplishing meeting city government's primary function? Hard question. Thank you. It just takes me a second to, to frame that a little bit. But so um, when you think about the primary function, the temptation is to say it's public safety. And certainly that's a piece of it. But I think it's more than public safety. It's really providing a, a, sh a quality of life that is assured, that does have, uh, that is safe, that uh, reflects the community's character, uh, that allows for citizens to do the things that make sense in an urban environment, uh, a variety of things. And I, I think University Place actually does that. Uh, I think we continue to refine it, as we should. We need to revisit some key pieces periodically, uh, making sure that the vision that we're working towards is a vision that is shared with the community, making sure that values are understood between where the city is applying those values and where the residents' values or community values are. So it's, it's a literal process. You need to go back and forth and make sure all these pieces are in place. But assuring safety and a quality of life Yes, I think the city UP does that. Thank you. Again, the primary reason for government of the university place, uh, uh, when we started this whole program, before we started it, Citizens for Corporation, was to get more services, keep taxes low, uh, get uh, a, a good, strong police force, which is the problem with we have right now because we've reduced it much. And we're, we're just not doing it. We, from the beginning of the city, we went away from what we had become a city for into doing all this extravagant stuff that just makes no sense and costs a lot of money. And we have got right down there at the city's so-called center. Uh, we've got a mix of, we've got the police department, we've got the fire department, we've got things we're supposed to be selling things. Everything is coming together when there's a fire, when there's a, a robbery someplace. 
it just we got to start all over and redo this thing and go to the plan that we had when we first started the city because we're not doing it and if we if we don't get real and quit all this things that these two gentlemen really like and some of you people might like and get down to the fact of not spending a lot of money and borrowing any more money at all period thank you mr grassi i think the primary function of the city is um, first and foremost enacting legislation and ordinances that set the guidelines um, for order and for the value of the city for all of its citizens um, and I believe the city has done a good job of creating these functions over the last 22 years. They're reviewed annually, discussed annually, and you know, we revise them to go with current times. But um, I believe for a city that's only 22 years old that we've um, done a good job with that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tainer. Boy, that is a tough question. The there's so many functions that the city needs to fulfill. Um, primarily, I think, um, aside from the services, is to watch out that our money is spent responsibly. It's hard won for each of us, and we need to watch out for that. Um, I really do believe that we need to do a little bit less contracting and start standing on our own and that it would serve us well insofar as our um, costs and our debt. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mull, now you're first on this question. Now that we are deeply into the regional growth plan, what do you think should be done differently? And it says about future development, and the other thing it says is fundraising, which I don't really understand, but if you do, you can deal with it. Repeat that question, the first part. Especially. Now that we're deeply into the regional growth plan, what do you think should be done differently? And the questioner wants to know about regarding future development, and I guess raising funds, rather than what I think of as fundraising, about development and raising money. Uh, development, I don't know where we're going to have any more room to develop anything. It's a small area. The area that the town center is at is too small for what the plan was in the first place. Uh, we talk about Amazon. Amazon, it doesn't have enough uh, space in the city of University Place to do anything that Amazon wants to do because they're so big. Uh, all you have to do is go a few miles from here and see uh, what they do. They got the Whole Foods because they owe Jeff Bezos. Amazon owns Whole Foods. We just have used up all our land and ideas uh, and something that isn't really real. And when you talk about doing all these great things, you just don't have the space to do it, nor the money to do it, nor the people to come and put more money into it, or they would have already been here. Space like down the Chambers Bay. People would have done that a long time ago if it was a feasible thing. But you can't find people to put the money in, along with the plan that either one of these people put or anybody puts, because they're not feasible to start with. Amen. Thank you. Mr. Grassi. We've just been meeting this week, um, getting an update on the regional growth plan. It will be submitted in December of this year for final review. But really what it boils down to is defining the areas in the city that are ripe for redevelopment or that are underutilized. If you look at areas like Narrows Plaza, how spaced out that is. It's a prime area for more intense use, for more density. And so those are the areas that the city is looking at and working with the owners and putting together a plan which will enable us with this designation. Um, it enables us to apply for grants. The city has been hugely successful in past years for grants. And a lot of people say, well, it's still tax dollars. But my answer to that is, would you rather have those tax dollars that you're going to pay anyway? We all have to pay them. Wouldn't we rather see them spent in university place than in other jurisdictions. So that's what it's about. It's a, it's a designation that we've worked for a long time to get. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tainer. Um, the regional growth center issue thing is all a little bit of a mystery in my lifestyle. But I am seeing a lot of people come into the community who are using the transportation systems to get to their jobs in Kent, Everett, Seattle, whatnot. And they're saying that in the statistics that the people who are coming here, University Place, Tacoma, Seattle, this area, 
are coming here with the idea that they're traveling regionally with public transportation. It's really not a bad idea, and we've already marched down this road. We're going to have to make a success out of it somehow or another. Thank you. Mr. Worthington. So thank you. Well, with the Regional Growth Plan, we, the objective there is to coordinate uh, in a three-county region our, uh, our growth in some planned process where we have transportation uh, corridors, infrastructure in place and underway. For us, when we apply it here, uh, it's, a, uh, it's been a challenge because of the amount of population that is assigned to this area and all the processes that run here. Uh, but as we take a look at the specifics of the sub-area plan that we call, call, uh, call it, uh, basically at the uh, Narrows Plaza, you know, broader than, much broader than that. But it, we're seeing that those densities are available there to meet those targets. We're also seeing the opportunities that are there. And for us, a couple of things we can do to bring those opportunities are uh, shift the densities in order to make the projects more economical, and then further to change our zoning processes so there's a little more certainty about both what can happen and the process time it'll take. Today, it takes a long time to do a zone change. And if we can move that quicker, then somebody can take advantage of an opp uh, opportunity in the market sooner. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Grassi, you answered this one first. Right now, citizens have an extremely short time period to get informed about council agenda topics. What will you do to improve communication so that citizens can learn about topics in a timely manner? And what will you do to encourage and promote citizen participation? Well, we love citizen participation. And if you come to some of our council meetings, some nights it's, there's a, a fairly good crowd and other times it's pretty lonely in that room. So we always welcome people and encourage people to come. And of course, that's why it's being broadcast on UPTV, so people that can't can still feel a part of what's going on. I know there's been criticism about um, topics being printed in a timely manner. And I'm not trying to play the blame game, but those agendas are set by the mayor and the mayor pro tem at an agenda meeting that's held weekly. Um, new leadership will take place in January. And I hope that as a council, that will be something that we will discuss. We always have a workshop a retreat um, at the first of the year. And that is something that I've already have notes on because I've had calls and criticism from several people on that. So it is something easy to change. And I believe that with the new year, we'll make sure that that's better so that people do have enough time to be able to set their calendars if they want to be a part of that meeting. Thank you, Ms. Tainer difficult and I have noticed it and it's hard to keep up with what's going on. I've also noticed that at the website if you want to see what's going on with the city council there's three or four different points of entry. It's hard to get from the agenda to the minutes and the past minutes. It should be a, a clear path and those things should all be in one place. It's not laid out very well. I'd like to see it more open. I did also note at, at one city council meeting where my opponent was promoting the idea that you could watch the city council meeting on your cell phone so you didn't have to come, <laughs> which I thought was uh, really the wrong, wrong approach. I'd like to see more people participating. I think we all would. Mr. Worthington. Thank you. Certainly we'd uh, all like to see more participation and uh, chance to see the uh, people in the meetings and hear their comments too when they have uh, uh, an opportunity to hear the issues directly. Uh, the, uh, the issue about uh, timely agendas is, uh, uh, it seems simple mechanics, there's a few little challenges to it. So we could undoubtedly get a tentative agenda out earlier, but the public would need to understand that those agendas could change. And when they think an item's coming, that item could drop off the agenda um, at uh, only a few days before uh, because the item isn't quite ready and something has shifted. Uh, so that's always uh, uh, the challenge. I, in this city, I think our agenda is basically firm up only about Thursday. Um, and and all. But we could try a tentative agenda approach. And folks would have a chance to see what's coming. There undoubtedly would be some, the occasional surprise. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Molno. The reason that people don't participate in the meetings is pretty simple. It's because of the council itself. 
People come in and go to respond. They get three minutes, three minutes, where if you're an ex or a friend of somebody, you get all the minutes you want. They got to be friendly to the people. The people should be come in, and if they got an idea, they want to say it, you say it. If it takes five minutes or 10 minutes, let them do it. But then respond. The city council, they're playing with their papers, they're doing this, they're going over there, we're handing stuff around. Pay attention to what the people are saying and then respond to it at the next meeting relative to what they asked the previous meeting. You don't do that here. They couldn't care less because they're playing with their papers and talking to each other and handing things stuff around. This should stop. Come dress like we are. Some of these people come look like they're bums. And maybe they just got out of bed. I don't know. But you got to respect the people that are paying your, their salary, and they don't. Let them talk. Let them bring them. If they're not a very good talker, let somebody else speak and take up the rest of their minutes or whatever it happens to be, just like they do to their friends. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is going to be a yes or no question, and we're going to go backwards. We're going to start with you, and you actually only get to say yes or no. Are there circumstances under which you would support allowing casinos in University Place? Are there circumstances? Yes, that's, your, that's three words. We'll start at the other end. Ms. Tanner. No. Okay, no. Mr. Worthington. No. Are there circumstances under which you would support casinos in University Place? If it made money, small. That's yes. it. I'll take that as a yes. Mr. Grassi? No. Okay, thank you. Next, um, and let's try to, I want to get two more questions in, so let's do this. This one I'm going to ask, and you only get like 20 or 30 seconds because I just don't understand the question. <laughs> so, Ms. Tanner, you're first. If you are elected, what would you do to address the mess at 27th and Grandview? And I hope your answers will tell me what this question is about. You have 30 seconds. Oh, is that having to do with our non building project that's not going if on? If you don't know either, yeah. let's go to Mr. Worthington and yeah. see what he has to say. Certainly. So, 27th and Grandview has been a development project that has hung again and again. It actually is making slow, slow progress. And we have been able to get the area somewhat cleaned up. Uh, there's been some positive steps there, but it's really up to the people that own the property to do the job right. Thank you. Mr. Well, now. 27th and uh, 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 27th Grandview. Uh, it's been a problem. It's a little center there, in case you don't know what it is. It's been a little shopping center, and it hasn't worked good. Get the people together, talk to them. If they want to like put something else there, tear it down, just so that the people that are already have the buildings there make some money or get the money back that they put into it would be a good idea because they've been residents of the of the city going to place for that period of time. But listen to them, get them into talk to the city council and maybe get some input from the real people themselves if they could actually get them into the meetings because looking for four, four hours on TV and going back and forth about meaningless stuff like the fireworks deal for hours and when you just should say no. Thank you, Mr. Grassi. That's a topic that um, is one of my pet peeves, but unfortunately when the city doesn't own the property, there's not much you can do. Uh, that particular corner has been sold to Shag Housing. You probably see their commercials on TV. It'll be a wonderful project when it's built, but you know, for financial reasons or other projects that they already have before that, things get held up. There was a chemical spill there because of a dry cleaner on the property years ago, and so it, that is being addressed and being worked on, but that corner will be a prime, beautiful um, project when it's done. Okay, Ms. Tanner, do you know have the information to answer? Or are you done? To answer that? Yeah. I'm aware of that project, but there were also some questions going on down there about cutting trees that people oh. were really angry about. Oh. Um, it, it seems to me that um, within University Place that we're having a, a big spur of nonprofit investment. And I think that that has a lot to do with the, um, our taxing requirements on business. And I also understand that there are that that structure or zoning or that building project is planned to be six stories, okay, which is going to knock out a lot of views for a lot of residences upstream from that, okay, time is up. which concerns me. Uh, this will be the last question. Mr. Worthington will answer it first. 
And we've heard a lot about the amount of debt the city owes, and I think I've heard several different numbers, but okay, there is a lot of long-term debt. How does this affect providing core services to UP residents, and what do you think we do about it? Could you repeat that one more time, please? Yes. How does this huge long-term debt affect the providing core services to University Place residents, and what can we do about it? So uh, the answer to the question is yes, it has affected our it's providing core services. Our debt payment takes up, it's the second largest expense the city has. Uh, first is our public safety program, and second is debt, and it runs, I think, about three and a half million as debt service or so. What we can do about it is very, very limited. We've signed bonds, that go, and these bonds have been in place for a very long time. Uh, we've, uh, we owe the money. We need to pay back our debt, and that is one of the base things that we do uh, uh, when you pledge uh, your uh, credit in such a matter as a city. What we can do, though, is look for opportunities to reduce that debt, and when we have extraordinary revenue, which I've proposed to the city council members, uh, that we use some of that to reduce our debt when possible. Uh, I've looked into the details, and it is possible, but the, balloon, the opportunities for early payment are rare and uh, rather substantial amounts, but we can do that. The other thing we can do is look for refinancing, which we recently did, and thanks to prudent financial policies that this council has had, we've saved the taxpayers $4 million of future interest expense because of better finance uh, policies and new credit rating. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Molnow. The answer to this question is right on the website of University Place. It's a debt reduction plan. There is no wiggle room. Anything these people say is strictly BS because it's right there on paper and read it. It's, it's an official paper from the uh, information from the University Place finance people. All you have to do is read it. There is no wiggle, wiggle room. I don't think they have it. If they see it, they know it. They should know it. It goes up for 20 years. There's no wiggle room. In fact, in about eight years, it's going to have we're going to be behind the power curve again. So we're not going to be able to pay it. So we're going to have to give more taxes. Where do we get them from? We're going to come over to your house and take your house? Uh, well, they're going to do that with taxes. The only way they can do it is get maybe some businesses going, but they're not really happy with businesses, only the certain kind, Whole Foods and things like that. Um, you've got to get real here. You've got to talk to the, to the businesses, open it up, open these streets up, talk to the people and the businesses. The only way you can do it is with businesses. If you got Amazon, that would be great a small part of it. But when you won't even talk to the businesses who are friendly with them and you all kind of heap all kinds of little bitsy things on them have to do, it's not friendly. We got to get real. We haven't done that. The University Place website says it. Just read it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Grassi. Well, currently all core services that the city is required to provide are provided. And as debt is repaid, then that will give the city the opportunity to increase the core services, and that is a goal for everyone serving on city council, and I believe it would be for any new members on city council as well. All debt payments are made. They're made timely. Our budget, you know, we, we have a balanced, sustainable budget, and I think that's critical for you to know and hear. The goal remains to repay debt as quickly as we can. We are constantly looking for opportunities to reduce it. It has to be paid, we will pay it, and as economic development grows in the city, which it is, that will give the opportunity to reduce that debt quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, no, Ms. Tainer. Sorry, <laughs> Um. I don't deal in high finance like the city. I guess I'm going to learn a little bit about it, hopefully, if you vote for me. I do know that I refinanced um, three of my properties last year and another property some years before that. And we're talking $130,000, $150,000 refinanced for a home. Cost several thousand dollars to do that. Yes, it reduces the mortgage payment and you have an opportunity to pay down the debt. But it costs a lot of money. I've got to wonder how much it costs to refinance $13 million in debt and how much that cost us. When a lot of that debt was having to do with the town center, those properties were purchased and a debt structure on us. 
And when those monies came in with the sales of those properties, it was told that we couldn't really do anything with it because it was a one-time revenue stream and it just disappeared like fairy dust. I think that there's more that we can do to, to spend our money responsibly and watch our debt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all and thank you audience for wonderful questions. It is now time for closing statements. Each candidate may have up to one minute to make a statement, and reversing our order, Mr. Grassi will go first, then Mr. Molnow, Mr. Worthington, and last, Ms. Tainer. Uh, Carl Molnow, running position number four. Grassi, oh. Mr. Grassi is first. Oh. All right. Carl Molnow, position number four. We'll let Mr. Grassi go first because it's his turn. Thank well, you. Sorry. Call my name for it. I do. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you to the League of Women's Voters for hosting and moderating this event. Thank you for your attendance tonight. Thank you to um, our audience viewing from home. As a small business owner in University Place, and we chose University Place purposely because we believe in this community, I know firsthand the day-to-day -day challenges that businesses face. I haven't, nor will I support new taxes that negatively impact business because we need to grow our economic development. I remain committed to represent business interests on the City Council, carefully and thoroughly considering any legislation or decision that would have any negative impact on our business community. I care about any and all concerns that come from our citizens, and I will always try to respond to you quickly as possible, I will get back to you. I make that commitment. I have the fire in my belly, and about 20 extra pounds there as well, that I want to want to make this city even better and stronger than it is today. And it would be my privilege to continue to serve you for the next four years. I would greatly appreciate your vote between now and November 7th. Thank Th you. Thank you, Mr. Grassi. Mr. Molnow, your statement, please. Carl Molnow, running position number four. I moved to University Place because I love the place. I lived here for 20 some years before we became a city. And every time I needed something, we had to go to the county, which was fine because you go in there, I got other people to go and we got the things we needed. But since we've become a city, that's, that's just went out the window. We've got things we don't need, flowers and all this other junk that we are paying for to just uh, uh, your lives. We need to get the people to come into the uh, council meetings, tell us what they want, and continue to do in that particular manner which we planned when we started this thing a little over 22 years ago. Get back to reality, none of this fluff, just do what we have to do. And uh, I appreciate your voice. One other thing, one of our council members, Lorna Smith has cancer, I'd like you to remember her and her in your prayers and your thoughts, and hopefully she will uh, take and become better and going through her chemotherapy, which she's only run 10% so far. Thank you very much. Just go to the web page and find out the debt reduction plan. We have no wiggle room. Thank you, Carl Mono. Thank you, Mr. Molnow. Mr. Worthington. <clears throat> thank you, Lee. I wanted to thank the League of Women Voters and uh, putting this on and appreciate the opportunity for to chat with all of you here. And after we get done, maybe chat then too. But, I started this evening talking, telling you a bit about myself, about being a city manager and such. I also mentioned I was a business person. I want to tell a brief story about when I lived in Spokane. We had a business there called Henry's Pub. Henry's Pub was on Riverside, not too far from the Onion Bar and Grill, if you know where that's at. The reason I mentioned it is one day I go into the, into the, uh, uh, into the pub for, uh, open the pub for business. It's about 10 a.m. or something like that. There's a new street sign in front of my business and all along the street, it says no parking from, I think it was 8 p.m. to 3 a.m. Well, I have a pub. Uh, there's no parking in front of my business during its peak time. And the city gave me no notice of that. I got my neighbors together. I got an attorney. I sat down with the city, and we worked out something that could address their needs and our neighborhood's needs. But I want you to know I always remember that, the unintended consequences, the people that are not in the room, and as a council member, that's what I try and keep in mind, because that can really change things for a small business person or a resident. I hope you agree. Worthington's worth your vote. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Worthington. Ms. Tainer, your statement. My statement. 
Thank you, Liz, and thank you, the League of Women Voters. This is the second opportunity I've had to work with you, and and it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Very well done. Um, I I would like to have your vote. I think I would do a good job, and I I understand the struggles of of keeping food in the fridge and and a roof over your head and utility bill paid, and I understand that. As a person on the city council, I would have an opportunity to defend your interests and um, challenge us to do better. I think that we can. I know that we can. And I'd like to take a run at it. Thank you. Thank you. Huge thanks to the candidates who are in attendance. And applause is now appropriate. <laughs> Quite done. I want to thank the candidates both for running for office and for being here to share their views this evening. For further information about the candidates, you will shortly receive your voters pamphlet from Pierce County and may also want to visit vote411.org. If you put in your address, you can see the candidates' answers to some other questions. I also wish to thank Susan Eidenschenk, our timekeeper, and Beverly Bowen Bennett, David McInturf and Hank Tans, all from the League of Women Voters, for distributing and collecting cards, Linda Sees and Amanda Kleber from UP for organizing the forum, the camera crew from UPTV, those who submitted and asked, and asked questions, and all who have attended. Please continue doing all you can to make your vote an educated one. Now, don't forget to use that vote. Election day is Tuesday, November 7th. You should receive your ballot in the mail around October 19th, and it must be postmarked or placed in a ballot drop box by November 7th. Thank you, and please stay and socialize with the candidates and each other for a while. Good night. <laughs>